On Friday, Democratic presidential candidate Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York met with voters and delivered remarks at a brewing company in Manchester, New Hampshire. This is about an hour and 10 minutes. Welcome aboard, how are you? Thank you so much. Hey guys. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to Appreciate the you being here. All right. Don't hide back here. You gotta be a part of the crowd. Hey. Look 
It's pretty, pretty colours. It's pretty colours. Yes. It's peach. It's peach colour. And who's this? Who's that? You really want to say hi? Who's this? Hi, hi. Emma. Hi, Annie. Who's this? Is this your little brother? What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? <laughs> What's your, is your full name? That's it. I love your name, <laughs> Emmy. I love Thank it. You. Friend of the pod. Oh, yeah. What's not to love? Right? <laughs> She's beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> All right. Are we going to do it from here? Yeah, right here. And we'll get you the mic really quickly. Yeah, we're going to stand right here, guys. Two Share Brewing Company. We'd like to uh, thank Senator Gillibrand for coming out today. Um, our concept with Two Share is to have a neighborhood pub where you can have a great beer and listen to crying babies and meet your neighbors and doing that in New Hampshire with the first of the nation primary also means you have an opportunity to meet your political candidates. So we feel like this is an important part of what we can bring to the community. And we are super excited to hear from the Senator today. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for giving me a beer. I'm very excited about my Kirsten Wisen. Anyway, thank you guys for being part of this democracy. Thank you for having this amazing establishment. Thank you for the delicious beer. Um, and thank you for welcoming all of us in the community in. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So, hello everyone. Um, so since most of you don't know a thing about me, I'm gonna talk a little bit about who I am and then I'm gonna tell you why I'm running for president and then I'm gonna tell you why I'm gonna win and beat Trump, okay? Okay. So, start, start small. I got my start in politics when I was really young. I loved politics because my grandmother loved politics. My grandmother was a lady who never went to college she came from very modest means, um, but she worked every day of her life, but she was a secretary in the state legislature. And she recognized 75 years ago, of course, that all the legislators were men, and all the support staff were women, and she wanted to have a say. And so she was trying to figure out, how do I amplify my voice? How do I get heard in this time? And so she recognized that if she organized women in the legislature and in her community, and got them interested in campaigns, they could actually affect the outcome. And they did. They were ladies who did door to door, they did envelope stuffing, they did phone banking, they did all the stuff you need to win a modern day campaign. And over time, these ladies became powerful. In fact, you couldn't get elected if you didn't have the blessing of my grandmother and her lady friends. <laughs> because those Watching her, watching her be this woman, larger than life, who truly believed that public service and politics was the way to help people, to make a difference in their lives, and to have a voice in what's happening in your community. And I love that about her. So I always aspired to do public service. I just didn't know how, and I didn't know when. 
Um, fast forward till I'm 20-something uh, years old and sitting in New York City and working for a big law firm. And I'm from upstate New York. I'm from a pretty rural part of New York. It's agriculture, small cities, small towns. And I watched Hillary Clinton go to China and she gives her big speech, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And I thought to myself, why wasn't I invited? Well, <laughs> I wasn't invited because I wasn't involved in politics. And so that's when I had my aha moment that I need to get involved as an adult. And so I started working on campaigns. I spent about a decade working on campaigns for other people, helping them raise money, helping them organize, helping them get their message out. And I recognized during that time that that's really what I wanted to do. And so when I decided that I actually wanted to run for office, I called a friend of mine. And this is about 10 years after Hillary gave her speech and working for other campaigns. And I called the friend who's a pollster. He's still my pollster. His name's Jeffrey. I call up Jeffrey and I say, Jeffrey, I really want to run for Congress in the place where I'm from. It's upstate New York. And I want to know if I have a shot. He looks up the district. And he said, ooh, ah, sorry, no, you can't win that district. I said, really? He said, no. I said, well, I've been helping other candidates for a decade. Clearly, I can raise a lot of money. I can raise maybe $2 million and get my message out. Can I win then? He said, no. It's two to one Republican. You can't win the district. So I'm thinking, well, what happens if I run the perfect campaign? Clearly, I can win then, right? He said, no. There are more cows than Democrats in your district. You actually cannot win your district. I said, well, you know, what happens if this guy gets indicted? Can I win then? And he said, well, he said, it depends what he gets indicted for. So you can imagine, in New Hampshire, you, you don't have as red of places, but you got some red places. This was two to one Republican. And I decided to run anyway, and miracles do happen. The only person who thought I could win, actually, was my mother. Um, but I proved her right, and I did run close to the perfect campaign. I did raise the $2 million. But the one mistake my opponent made, which is one of the reasons why I'm going to win, is because he never took me seriously. In fact, when I started running, he said, oh, she's just another pretty face. And I, of course, said, Thank you. <laughs> and then I started to talk about how we got our troops out of Iraq. Because even though it was a two to one Republican district, I wanted to run on the progressive issues that the base of my district cared so deeply about. They were actually protesting getting out of Iraq in every federal building for years. And I understood that this was not working for our country. But knowing that I have a red district, I was able to talk to people in a place, in a way they could understand, saying like this, that. Every military expert I've talked to, every general, every CIA, every foreign policy expert has said, you cannot defeat terrorism in Iraq if the Iraqis themselves will not push out the terrorists. So that our deployment of troops is ineffective. It is not how you defeat terrorism, so we should redeploy them out. That made sense to an upstate New York district with the highest veteran total in the whole state because they understood what service meant, but they also understood about national security. And so I was for out of Iraq. I also ran, surprise, surprise, in 2005 on Medicare for All. Now, that was a really simple idea. Back then, it was a very simple idea because people couldn't afford health insurance. It was before Obamacare. They were dropping people's coverage the second you had any condition. Pre-existing conditions were the death knell. They were discriminating against people, charging women more than men, all the things that happened before Obamacare. And so when I said, well, wouldn't you love a not-for-profit public option? Amen. Wouldn't you yeah. love to be able to buy into Medicare at a percentage of income no matter who you are, no matter when you need it? And because the truth is, the insurance industry isn't designed to offer universal care. They're just not. It's a for-profit industry. And they take a big lay la la layer of fat out of healthcare because they want those profits. They need quarterly profits. They pay their CEOs a lot of money. Um, they want to make sure that uh, they have quarterly returns for their shareholders. That's a fact. So when they deny you the second day in the hospital or the medicine you really want to take or the procedure that your doctor says you need, they're not denying it because it's for human health. They're denying it because they want to make money. Now remember this theme. This is the difference between capitalism and greed. When you cross over and say it's more important to make money than actually help people or cure people or meet their health care needs, that is the definition of greed. So I don't think the insurance industry is the, the right way to actually fund health care. So I said, let's let people buy in. Overwhelmingly, two to one Republican district loved it. That's how I know this country will support Medicare for all on a bipartisan basis. Because you just have to explain to them what it is, why it works, and 
why the insurance industry is failing us. They don't want us to be healthy. They want to make money. It's just a different purpose. So miracles do happen. I won. I won by six points. Shocker, shocker. But the bigger shocker is this. When my opponent, my next opponent said, ah, she should have never won. It was just a fluke. So he decides to run a negative campaign, a very nasty negative campaign. And he was a self-funder. He spent nearly $7 million on this race. Now, the funny thing about life is when I was first elected, I had a three-year-old named Theo. During my first term in office, I'm pregnant out to here with my second child, Henry. I have Henry, and so I'm walking around the district doing Congress in your corner, going to bookshops and coffee shops and all the places that people meet to talk about what they care about. And I'm walking around the district with an infant and a toddler, and he runs all negative ads. And I learned something, and they weren't nice negative ads. They were pictures of me with my face in red wash, flames coming out of my head, and it said with a dark voice, she's not who you think she is. Okay, so I learned a truism in politics in that campaign. You actually cannot win a campaign with negative ads against a mom with an infant and a toddler. Because the truth is, no one believes you. And so I beat him by 24 points. So, why am I running and why am I gonna win? So I think what President Trump has created in this country is very destructive. I think the hate, the division, um, the rise in bigotry, anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, it's crushing our country. It's actually tearing at the moral fabric of our nation. And so we have to, each one of us has to fight against it. I think we are all called we are all called to do whatever it takes to defeat what he has created. We used to, in our best moments in this country, believe in the golden rule. We used to care about one another, believing that I should treat you the way that you want to be treated. That, that, is, that is how we were designed. We used to care about the least among us. We used to care about our neighbor. We, were, we weren't afraid of our neighbor. In our best moments as a nation, we welcomed refugees. That's what the Statue of Liberty stands for. She stands there as the beacon of light and hope, saying, send me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. She stands there for a reason. Because in our strongest moments, that's when immigrants came to our country and thrived and helped build this country. We're a country founded by immigrants. Our, our country's built by immigrants. Our diversity has always been a strength. So I believe that each one of us is called to this moment to fight as hard as we possibly can for what we believe in. Now, the day after, the day after President Trump was inaugurated, what happened? The world responded. I don't know how many people here marched. I certainly marched. But that march was the largest global protest in the history of the world. Millions of people marched, and it didn't matter what your sign said. It could say Black Lives Matter, or Women's Reproductive Freedom, or Clean Air and Clean Water, or... Uh, Immigration rights, it didn't matter. It just mattered that you cared enough to be heard. And that is the revival of our democracy. That is what started two years ago that must be completed by defeating Trump. It, in 2018, yes, clap for that. That is a thing to clap for. We will defeat him. In 2018, it was a first moment for a lot of first time candidates. How many people do you know worked on a campaign this cycle? Probably a lot. Because people felt so disgusted, so angry, so disturbed by what President Trump has wrought and said, I personally am gonna fight against it. I personally will stand in the breach and actually run for Congress, something I'm really afraid to do, but I'm gonna do it. But that's what people did. 120 women ran for Congress and won. The first two Muslim Americans. The first two Native Americans, many women of color, many young women, many first-time candidates because they had this passion and drive to fight for our democracy. And what is our democracy really about anyway? It's about us. It's about the people. It's about people who are willing to fight for what they believe in, that when they see something wrong, they don't stay silent. They rise up, they fight against it, they call it out. You call out racism when you see it. You call out anti-Semitism when you see it. You call out homophobia when you see it. And you say, that is not the American I love. We are a country that's been built to welcome others, to actually thrive on diversity, on innovation. But it's why we can't be afraid of the future and actually have to have a vision for the future. And I'm just gonna talk about two things. Healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. Fact, should be a right and not a privilege. It is the most important human right there is. 
So why not have Medicare for all? Why not let anybody buy in at a price they can afford? Why not make it an earned benefit over time, just like Social Security? If you can have a single payer system, I promise you, you will bend the cost curve. Everyone will have preventive care and you will have better health care. Second issue, Green New Deal. Let's be really specific. So Green New Deal is a platform of ideas about how to address global climate change. Global climate change is the greatest threat to humanity that exists today. And you must know this. And when you have a threat to humanity as big as global climate change, so devastating it will kill millions of people over time, you have to respond with a vision that is big enough to attack the problem. When John F. Kennedy said, I want to put a man on the moon in 10 years, not because it's easy, but because it's, it's hard, he, he, he didn't know if he would actually get a man on the moon. He just said, we have to try. And he knew that it was a measure of how innovative we could be, our excellence of our, of our country, the exceptionalism that America is known for. He said, if any country can solve this, it's, it's us. So why not say, we want to have a green economy in 10 years? Why not say, let's get to net zero carbon emissions in 10 ways? Why don't say it? Why not put it out there as the ambition of the country, as the goal, as the measuring factor of how smart are we? How courageous are we? How innovative are we? How, how, how clever are our scientists, our engineers? We want every kid in America to say, yeah, I'm gonna solve that problem. I'm gonna be the one to create an energy efficient car, or maybe one that flies. Like, that's what you want. You want that vision. Because kids, when John F. Kennedy said that, said, I wanna be an astronaut. I wanna go to the moon. It was part of our national character. Make this part of our national character. It's easy stuff. It's actually really bipartisan. There's three parts of the Green New Deal. It's really three parts. It's infrastructure, something that this state desperately wants. Not only do you want, not only do you want high-speed rail, not only do you want more mass transit, not only do you want sewer systems and basic infrastructure, that's point two. Point, point one. Point two, green jobs. We want more jobs. We want green energy jobs, wind, solar, geothermal, hydropower, biofuels. Build it. Teach the kids science, technology, engineering, and math so they can do the jobs of the future. And last, clean air and clean water. How many times do we have to read about PFAS or PFOA or some other horrible carcinogen in our water or different pollutants in our air? How many stories do we have to hear about institutional racism where communities that are left behind are, are routinely poisoned in air and water because no one cares? That is not good enough. So that's what the Green New Deal is. It's three basic things. Infrastructure, green jobs, clean air, clean water. We can do that. I would add one more thing, just because it's important, put a price on carbon, and I'll explain. The best way to create innovation is to use market forces to your advantage. If you tell a polluter you're gonna pay more because you're polluting, they're gonna put their money elsewhere. You tell an innovator you're gonna have a lower tax rate because you innovate, because you know how to create efficiencies in green energy, money's gonna go there. That's how cash flows. So dream big, don't give up. Know what you can do. And that's what I've done every 12 years I've been in public service. I had the high watermark for New York State. Despite you know, winning a two to one Republican district twice, I was able to bring this state together, my state, 72% of the vote, highest vote threshold in the history of the state, higher than Obama, higher than Hillary, higher than any human who's ever worked. I did that. And, and the interesting thing about that is because I listen. I can go to any community in my state, the red, red parts of upstate New York, the blue, blue parts of New York City, the purple parts of Long Island and Westchester, and listen and find the common ground. It's why I passed 18 bills in the last Congress. One of my bills that I worked with, Ted Cruz. Yeah, I work with everybody. The bill I worked with Ted Cruz, that bill ultimately was passed by the Rules Committee unanimously unanimously, so you can bring people together. You can get things done, and they can be big ideas like don't ask, don't tell repeal, because you know what? Sometimes you have to push your party to do the right thing. When members of my party said, mm, you know, not really convenient to do this right now, I looked them in the eye and I said, when is civil rights ever convenient? You do it because it's the right thing to do. So if you want a candidate who has the courage, the compassion, the conviction, and the fearless determination to take on the special interests, to take on the greed of Washington, the corruption of Washington, the lies of Washington, and all of the way this whole country is structured to value wealth more than everyday people. Support me.
Send me a dollar, just a dollar. Sign up to my website. It makes a difference. Kirsten Gillibrand, kirstengillibrand.com. I want your support. Thank you for coming out tonight. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can talk too. Take the mic. Hi. I guess I have to come closer. <laughs> um, so I was one of the Kavanaugh pro protesters um, in Washington, D.C., and I really appreciated your support around that, um, the Stop Cop Kavanaugh movement, yeah. and also your vocal support around the Me Too movement. Um, and as you know, the, the people who eventually apologize in the Me Too movement, that helps, but it doesn't repair all of the damage. Which Brings me to my question. I have a note just in case I forget. Um, I'm a lesbian, I've been out since 1993. And um, I'm uncomfortable with your record on LGBTQ rights. Uh, not in the past six years, but before that. Not in the past 10. I, okay. What I read in The Guardian recently is that you asked for people to focus on what you've done in the past six years. 10. 10 years. Ten. You have to take that up with The Guardian. I Ten years, I'm oh. in the house for two. Okay. Well, what I read was six. If it's ten, that's great. I just want to say that um, in the same article, it said that you don't change your values. And you, of course, were talking about you don't change your values in regards to Trump. But what I heard there was if your values don't change and there's this difficult history with being against gay marriage, does that mean that the changes we're seeing pretty recently are for political reasons and not for... Can I finish? I just have one more part of my question. <laughs> So I want to tell you a little bit about the years before you started getting involved in this issue. Because I was out for a lot of years before that, and I was fighting for equal rights and ma equal marriage in Massachusetts, and I was navigating homophobic teachers and classrooms for my son, and I was dealing with harassment in the workplace as a lesbian. Even coming here and coming out as a lesbian made me think about how can I walk back to my car? Will I be safe? Is this a safe environment? That, those experiences stay with us. And in that process, all of those things occurred because people in power allowed them to occur. They created a culture that allowed them to occur. So what I struggle with when I see that you get it with the Me Too movement and you get it with the Kavanaugh movement, when it comes to the LGBTQ movement, I see candidates who are with us authentically all along before there was any political gain to be had. And I'm just wondering why the LGBTQ community, which is large and we vote, why should we support you instead of somebody who was with us all along? You should support me. I've been with you all along. I have never opposed gay marriage. And in fact, I was the first statewide elected in my state ever in the history of America to be for gay marriage. First New Yorker, ahead of Hillary, ahead of Chuck, ahead of our governor. First one, number one. Number two, as a freshman senator in 2009 being appointed, I took the mantle of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. No one had been focused on it except for Ted Kennedy, and he was dying of brain cancer. I sat down with a member of the military, and I heard his story. His story was about why he joined the military, because he believed in the importance of serving, of the culture of, of courage and conviction and character. And he was so upset that he was forced, because of this horrific policy, to lie every day about who he is and who he loves. And so I took his story and I raised it up and I started to ask my colleagues, we need to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell because it's corrosive. And I understood that some people maybe weren't yet for gay marriage, but I also understood how to find Republicans. Because with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we lost more than 1,000 um, members in mission critical areas, most 10% of our foreign language speakers, um, and countless of men and women who are doing their jobs every day. So I led the charge on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2009, before my state passed marriage equality. My state, when they voted on it before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, it failed. After Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, it succeeded. It built the momentum for state after state to begin to pass marriage equality. I believe in marriage equality. I do not think you should be discriminated against based on who you love. I am now leading the effort to make sure that your children and, and, and your family has every federal right and benefit that anyone else does. I lead the movement on trying to allow, allow LGBTQ couples to adopt, no matter who the adoption agency, they can't be discriminated against. So arguably, I don't think you have a better champion in the US Senate or in the US Congress than me and have a record for actually bringing Democrats and Republicans together to do the right thing to stand up for marriage equality. 
And so I am with you. I've performed gay marriages, including my brother-in-laws and his husbands. Um, I believe in gay rights, I always have. I grew up in a family where two of my mother's best friends were a gay couple, growing up with them, understanding what their lives were like to be discriminated against, understand the crippling nature of the AIDS epidemic and how it was literally ripping down their friends and destroying their communities. So not only have I been aware of these issues, but I've been at the forefront um, for the last 10 years, and I will always fight for you. I'm also at the forefront of the transgender movement. And this is really important, because President Trump would love the debate of the American people to be around transgender troops. And do you wanna know who's gonna actually walk into that fire in that breach? It's gonna be me, because I don't care. I dare him to continue to demonize men and women who will die for this country based on their gender identity. And I also understand how harmful this is. I, my son grows up in a, grew up in a school community where we had a transgender boy. I watched this little girl, uh, when she's in sixth grade, cut her hair short. I watched her dye it blue. I watched her change her name, and then I watched her in eighth grade say, I am a boy and I'm, I, I'm going to be identified as a boy, and I protect him. And the one thing I hate more than anything else about President Trump and what he does is he demonizes that little boy. And he's the last person the President of the United States should demonize because he is the most important person to protect. He is vulnerable and he needs the support of our president, our federal government, and every elected representative, and I am the person who will do that. Um, so I was not expecting to talk to you tonight, but now that I have you in front of me, I have some important questions to ask you. Um, my husband and I are both teachers in the community. I teach in Manchester, and my husband teaches at Pinkerton Academy. <laughs> so as you can probably suspect, we do not do it for the money. We do it for the passion and the love of education and uh, educating the youth of America, especially the poorest of them. Um, so somewhere between teaching math uh, social studies, English, teaching children to read and be kind to one another and have tolerance of each other. My, the most important part of my job is keeping 24 children safe every single day. And not a day goes by where I don't look for emergency exits, I don't go over evacuation plans in my head, and I don't think, I do not want to get a call from my husband that he is in fear for his life or his student's life. So. I just want to know where you stand as far as um, your policy on gun control, as well as responsible gun owners in the state and federally. So I believe that we have to take on the corporate corruption and greed that the NRA stands for. The reason why we've been unable to pass any common sense gun reform ever is because the NRA is largely funded by the gun manufacturers, them and maybe Russia, which we don't know yet. But we do know that they are largely funded by the gun manufacturers. And unfortunately, because the gun manufacturers only care about gun sales, they oppose the common sense reform that can save lives. They want to oppose universal background checks because they want to sell an assault rifle to a teenager in a Walmart, or to someone on the terror watch list, or to someone who's gravely mentally ill with a violent background, or to someone with a criminal conviction for a violent crime. They want to sell those weapons. That's why they oppose universal background checks. That's why they, they won't oppose something as simple as bump stocks or uh, banning assault rifles or large magazines. They want to sell those things, no matter what, to anybody. And it's why they won't do common sense things like have an anti-trafficking law. I mean, honestly, in a state like New York, our number one problem is that guns used in crimes get trafficked from out of state right into the hands of gang members. And they will not even support an anti-federal gun trafficking law. So they are corrupt. This is the definition of corruption, it is the definition of greed, and they have a chokehold on Congress unlike anything I've ever seen. And so common sense members of Congress that you think would be for these things aren't because they're so afraid of the NRA. So we as Americans need to fight back, and this goes to the democracy part. Our democracy only works when everyday people stand up and demand it. We need to create a revolution in this country where every person's voice is heard, that we vote, that we lift up our voices, we demand transparency. I think it's great that we have a lawsuit right now after the gun manufacturers to begin to talk about the fact that the way Washington works is the powerful and the lobbyists get to write legislation in the dead of night because they have so much power. 
we have a law that says you can't sue gun manufacturers for a gun crime. There's no other industry ever in the rest of the country that has that kind of protection. That's because of corruption. It's because of the greed in Washington. So one of the things that I'm running on is publicly funded elections. We need to get money out of politics. That's why I'm not taking corporate PAC checks, not taking federal lobbyist money, not having an individual super PAC. Because you have to displace the power structure in Washington if you want any chance of restoring our democracy into your hands. This is the way democracy should work. It should be your, your, sen your senator, your congressperson, or your president standing in front of you and answering your questions. That is the way it is supposed to work, and that's what we need to restore. Because until I am answerable to you and not to the special interests in Washington, then we're not going to get the things done we need to get done. And so we have to demand more. And that's why I'm running on publicly funded elections. Hi, uh, Senator. Hi, Senator. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I want to take a second to ask you about Alzheimer's. Uh, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and almost 100,000 Granite Staters are affected either directly or indirectly by this disease. And so I'm wondering, if you're elected president, what will you do to solve Alzheimer's? Well, the first thing I would do is unwind President Trump's hateful budget where he cut all the NIH research and all the research and development necessary to find a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, because the truth is, our baby boomer population is aging and they will have large numbers of patients who have Alzheimer's and we're not closer to a cure. So we need to fund basic research, but we also need to fund what they call translational research, which means research that results in cures. And we should be funding in the NIH um, we also have a challenge for people who do have Alzheimer's. They need 24-7 care. And one of the biggest challenges we have today in this country, we have a nursing shortage in a lot of states, but we also don't even pay home health aides minimum wage. So we need to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, uh, to at least $15 an hour. We need to index it to inflation, and we need to ask young people to actually go into healthcare fields. It's one of the ways I want to achieve free college for those who need it. I want to expand the GI Bill. And by that I mean, the GI Bill we know after World War II is the greatest economic engine of a generation. Because all these people who served in our military got to go to college, start businesses, and create uh, a growing economy. Why not expand it and say, if you're willing to do a year of public service, you can get two years of community college or state school. If you do two years of public service, you get four years of state school or community college. And, and why not make sure that public service can include health care? education, first responders, and military service as a way to get more young people into the pipeline of health care. If we do that, we will then have the home health aides and the nurses that we need for the Alzheimer population. So I would do two things. I would create a better care network for our seniors so they can age in place, and I would make sure we fund both basic and translational research so we actually find a cure. Thank you. so much, Senator, for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Please have another beer, enjoy yourselves, and cool off a little bit. It's hot here. So if you liked what you heard tonight, I really want to earn your support. Will you please go to KirstenGillibrand.com? Will you please send a dollar to say, I want to know more about your campaign. I want to earn my way to that first debate stage. I want to take on President Trump because I know I'm the best candidate to win. I know I'm the one who can win states like Ohio, states like Michigan, states like Pennsylvania states like Wisconsin, and you need someone who actually has won red places before and purple places, and someone who could bring this country back together again. I will do that. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's a delight to meet you all. Yes. One second, let me just quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, talking about how you worked with Ted Cruz on a bill, how is like your bipartisanship, like how will that translate into your debates and trying to make that positive that that is one of your core values, I guess, like walking across the so aisle. So you need to listen to everyone and find out what they believe in and what they care about, and you will find something that you both agree on. So with this example, Senator Cruz and I both wanted to end the sexual harassment framework in Washington because it was really horrible. Yeah. And so we had that common ground, so we got 
30 some odd senators on the bill and ultimately it got moved to the rules committee and passed unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tina Marie. We're going to do press a little bit later. We're going to let her talk to folks first. Okay, we'll if you hang out for a gaggle. We'll do that, okay? Senator, I'm Brittany's mother. It's so nice to I meet love Britt so much. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. It's so good to see you. So good Thank to you see for you coming too. out. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to spend a few minutes with her. And Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Okay. I want to tell you, you were my senator for almost a decade. Oh, my goodness. I moved up here two years ago from uh, New York City. Thank you. And I was, Great. Thank I was really proud to have you represent me. And I think it's wonderful listening to a powerful, intelligent woman come and talk about major issues surrounding our country. And I thought you did terrific, and I want to give you a hug. I love a hug. All right, thank you. I also run the New Hampshire Democratic Women's Caucus. Oh, and I would I'm, love to come meet you guys. Yes. Yeah, so if you, who is your, who is your state director? Um, Pat. Pat. Him. Uh, Okay, I'll go talk to him. Can you talk to him. I'd love to see your group next time I'm here. Yes, and we want to hear in particular from female candidates. And, um, I'd be and delighted. I'm very to excited about your candidacy. Thank you. And as a former New Yorker, you're wonderful. Thank you very much. How are you? How you doing, Pat? Hi, um, I'm Sarah. The four of us are actually currently serving our year of service with AmeriCorps. Awesome. Um, as Great. Student Conservation Association, we're here oh. as private citizens, obviously wonderful. not representing our organization. Thanks for coming. Um, we teach natural sciences in uh, oh, elementary awesome. schools around the Merrimack Valley region. Great. And we'll be serving in state parks later on this year doing education about uh, why we should conserve state parks. So I really hope that if you do get elected as president, you uh, help preserve the national park system and federally funded public lands I because that is will. a really important issue to it's us. It's important to me too and I like to visit our state and national parks as part of um, our heritage. Griffin is actually from Niagara yes, Falls. Yes, Niagara Falls. Yes, I'm so, I'm so. Do you so the USI is much nicer than the <laughs> Yes. Yeah, do yeah. you mind if we actually Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the good question. Taking my question. Oh, and thank you for asking it. Um, I just want to add the. I really appreciate all the things you mentioned, and I really appreciate the last 10 years. I hear you that it's 10 years. I just want to name that there was a long time before that that we were looking for support, and that that's what I really wanted you to speak to, was the, the time earlier on, because for people in my community, those years have stayed with us, and yeah. it feels like, where was the help when we were fighting for basic yeah. equality? So well, I, I was only that, in the house for two years, right, and right. I was so junior, I just didn't lead on the issue. Yeah. I wished I had. I was entirely in favor of gay rights, 100%. I have so many close friends who are gay throughout my entire life, since the time I was a child. So I fully support gay rights, and I always have. Thank you. I think when an article comes out and it says, just focus on the last however many years, to people who've been in the, that life yeah. for a lot longer, it feels like a well, lot of my life happened before I, that. I just you know? did, I didn't lead yeah. on it. It's yeah. not that I did anything terrible on it. I just didn't lead on it. Yeah. But I was once I was a senator, I was like, this is a platform for me because I care and um, I want to do something. I, I hope that you continue to talk about those issues. I, do. I hope that you continue to lift up the trans community because that is a huge vulnerable community right now. I was it glad is. to hear that. And I am the leader in protecting transgender troops. The leader. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take care. Thank you. Hi. So um, nice to meet you. Hi. I'm Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for coming. You guys want a picture? Yes. All of us? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ready? Yes. Oh, I'm So you were our state senator for a long time. So I just wanted to say I saw you speak on behalf of Hillary years ago, yeah. and so it's just really exciting and inspiring to see you speak on behalf of yourself. So oh, we're, thank you we're very really much. excited. Nice thank to meet you. you. Nice to meet you. And I would be remiss if I didn't put a shameless plug in for my uh, buddy Keith Powers, he's a yeah. city yeah. council, yeah. Lower he's East Side. So, yeah. Yes. Do you mind if we take a quick photo? Thank you. Thank you. And I wore my Dayton Flyers pin nice. for Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
at least to meet you. Lovely to meet you, Sandy and Philip Grant. I wanted to ask you a question. Yes, um, it's obviously a really crowded field this time around, and I wanted to know how you differentiate yourself from the rest of the pack. Yeah. So I think uh, being from a red part of my state and having represented it to the one Republican district, mm -hmm. I have unique ability to be able to reach across the aisle, get things done, understand what it's like to grow up in perhaps a rural area or a red area or a purple area, listen to everyone and find the common ground and actually get things done. I think this country needs to heal. We need someone who will bring us together. But we also need vision. And so you have to have a big enough vision to inspire our grassroots, to inspire the base of the Democratic Party. And that's why I think I'm the right candidate. I'm at the forefront of gay rights. I'm at the forefront of women's rights. I'm at the forefront of green energy and, and, and addressing global climate change the forefront of immigration reform and I've been doing it for the last decade in the Senate and doing it on a bipartisan right. basis. Absolutely. So I think I can actually do what needs to be done, yeah. inspire the base of the primary, win a place like New Hampshire or Iowa just by meeting with you, being in your community, asking for your vote, and then being in the general and winning those states that Hillary lost, being able to win Ohio, Wisconsin, right. Pennsylvania. Sure. And, Would you mind if I took a quick picture? I'd love well? it. Oh, yeah. sure. No, uh, you can do it on there? Yeah. Cool. Do you want to get in there? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's uh let's get Ben in there too. Okay, all right. Yeah. That's all the end. All right. Yeah. yeah. All, all of us I guess. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a different question that I'd yeah. like to ask you too. So uh, I've been thinking a lot about the New Zealand tragedy that happened earlier, and uh, it's made me think about the Islamophobia that's happening in our country right now too. Obviously, the best way that we can start to tackle that emotion and that sentiment is by kicking people like Trump out of office who stoke those kinds of fears. Um, but. I'm thinking about, you know, winning those people back in the long term and kind of kicking that emotion from their conscience. Are those people that, you know, are Islamophobes in the United States too far to kind of bring back to normal, you know, being normal or how do we how do we fix those people? I think you have to remind everyone what our story is as a country. Um, remind folks that our country is a nation not only founded by immigrants but built by immigrants. Right. And this country was founded on religious freedom. So in our best moments we, we don't we don't fear people who are unlike us. We welcome them. We believe right. in what the Statue of Liberty stands for. And in fact in our worst moments is when we've closed our borders, closed our war walls and demonized right. people. So I would really appeal to people's better angels and say what makes this country so strong and so exceptional is because we have them at our best moments welcoming and that we've not been afraid of differences and we've actually celebrated them. In fact, our economy is only as strong as it is because of all the diversity. Like we, right. The entrepreneurialism, the innovation comes from diversity, ways of thinking about things, sure. comes from different life experiences, different cultures. And so I would just really urge people to think about what actually makes us strong. It's not dividing us, it's, it's protecting one another. Right. Awesome. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much, Thank you so much. And then we've got to head back here for the gaggle. Uh, quick picture, or you're going to go. Hi. Thank you so much for what you do for Upstate. Can I grab a quick picture? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, Pictures? Yeah, yeah. Four seconds. Education. We have to fix our crumbling schools. We have to invest in early childhood education at Debbie College. Yeah. And we need more Thanks. affordable options for college, including free college. Great. 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 Nailed it. Yeah, thank, thank you. So guys do. Thank you so much. Here. My husband's right there too. And I was actually hoping thank that you would say hello to my kindergarten class. Yeah. They know that you're. Oh yeah. Do you want me to take it? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, do you mind? Yeah, I'm happy to see you. Can be in it. Ready? Yes. So, ready? Go. Will you say hi to Mrs. Bottos' kindergarten class? Hello, Mrs. Bottos' kindergarten class. This mommy asked the best question, and I hope that you're all learning about politics in kindergarten. I'm running for president of the United States. My name is Kirsten Gillibrand. Tell your mommy and daddy to vote for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. I think my son, I grew up in Westchester County, New York. <laughs> you did? Wonderful. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, so I got, I, 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 I,
like I ask about like uh, like like um kind of as well because uh, like I've been following like safety issues since like Sandy Hook. Yeah. Yeah. Because yes. I mean I was like I remember like 20 years ago yeah. when I was 13 I was watching Tyrell hearing about like a combine. It's horrible. Like that's why we have to take on the and, NRA. And, yeah, and also like I like I see like um since like since Parkland. The only thing as states like Georgia and Ohio done is like I'm supposed to arm teachers as opposed to. That's and, a terrible idea. Yeah. Do not arm the teachers. I, I, One more here with Alex. <laughs> okay. So sorry. So sorry. Alex. Hey. Do we have a book for her? Did we check? I have a book for you. No, no, but get. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And so where's Britt? Let's find her. Britt? Britt, we need a book for Alice. Do you have one in the car? Can you get one? Okay. Don't leave. I have a book for you and you have to have it. You're going to love it, I swear. I spent a lot of time writing it and the pictures are so beautiful. Nice. And it's all about strong young ladies like yourself. Woo -hoo. It's so great. Can I ask one quick question? Yes. My wife's a physician at a local hospital. So in about two hours, she's going to start getting hit with the uh, people that OD. Um, I really believe strongly, I love what you said about healthcare, because my wife is a fourth generation doctor, and she said basically, as soon as the, uh, what should we call it, the MBAs got into healthcare and turned it into profit, it was horrible. I really want the drug manufacturers to be held accountable. Totally. They push they this on everyone. They should be sued. Basically, the, the stuff that came out today yeah. that Purdue Pharmaceutical was purposefully making yeah. sure they had highly addictive drugs yeah. sending to so many people yeah. and misleading doctors. So I had a bill with John McCain to limit the supply of opioids to any any um, acute pain to seven days. Yeah. That would be a start. Um, we should be able to allow pharmacies to receive well, unused opioids. Yeah. We should have uh, money to make sure doctors are trained better on pain management. Yes. Um, and we should sue the drug companies yeah. and, and hold them accountable. And any any of these um, private equity companies or um, people who buy the drugs that are, have only one or two suppliers yeah. and then gouge the yeah. price, they should all, I have a bill to hold them all accountable to take away the profits. Yeah. Oh, in three days. Yeah. AMA says you only need three days three. of pain meds. That's fine. My wife three. is like, yeah, it's got to be three. That's all you so need. So I will change the bill. Because I got, I got like a root canal, and they gave me, I think, uh, 30 pills. That's if terrible. I wanted it, I was like, I don't and want any. It stayed in your like, cupboard, no. and somebody could take right, it. Right, yeah. right. So it's like, it's crazy. And if you threw it down the toilet, it would leach into our water. Right. Yeah, yeah there's nothing to do with it. It's all that stuff. It's all right, fun. cool. Awesome. You're the best. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. What? I don't like pollution. I don't either. And so <laughs> I think you need to take on the polluters and tell them if you pollute, then you have to pay to clean it up. Don't you think? Yes. If you make a mess, you clean it up. So why shouldn't they clean up the mess they made? Right? I love dolphins. I love dolphins too. And I love those. Who's getting the straws stuck in their nose? Uh, the otters? And the turtles. So we have to not use plastic straws to protect the turtles. Some people make like metal ones. You can make like uh, cardboard ones and they're better. Yeah. Yeah. So can I earn your vote? Will you tell your daddy to vote for me? Uh -huh. Thank you. Awesome. Thank when are you going to be able to vote? Is our book here yet? No. Do we have it? 20, you 28. It? Yeah, can we do the gaggle first? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll do the gaggle. So cool. wait two more minutes and you'll have your book before you go home, okay? And you can show it to your mommy when she gets home from work. Thank you. Nice. Thank What's you your so name? James Porter. James, lovely yeah. to meet you. Yeah. And your name you. again? Alice, right? Alice, Alice. yeah. She's I love Alice Porter boyfriend. I love it. What's up? Okay, let's do the gaggle. The notorious. Okay, can I come over? I just want to say, I'm a former Senate page, awesome. and um, I remember very distinctly uh, during the late night vote one year um, having a conversation with you and you telling me, I was talking about wanting to go to law school and you telling me that uh, to keep doing that and that's what go? I'm in New Hampshire doing. Awesome. I'm at 2-0 right now and I just want to say thank you and you're part of the reason Thank I'm you here. for talking to me. Of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. I can level phone it. Okay. I mean, if I can unlock my phone. <laughs> thank you. sexual assault oh, and I you. went to school in upstate New York and while I was working on a lot of campus sexual assault stuff there, lot. you were on the forefront. Well, God bless you. Thank you. you. Can I give you a hug? Yes. I just want to say thank you so much for being there for all of us. Well, I will always be. Before it was cool. I know, exactly. Thank you and I will always be. Thank you. Hi. Is there a question uh, about your platform? Sure. So, hi. the United States, we you know, frame ourselves as being the freest you know, country in the world. Yes. We have the largest prison population on the planet. Yes. Would your platform uh, support ending privately owned prisons, ending the war on drugs, 
and uh, pardoning those who are convicted of nonviolent drug offenses? For sure, some of that. Um, I'm for decriminalization of marijuana. I want to make it retroactive. Okay. I want to get rid of the. Um, Certainly the Rockefeller era drug laws, which is what we call them in New York because it was a governor who was in favor of them, but I think a lot of our drug laws are horrible. Mm -hmm. I, I need to look into whether we can get rid of for-profit prisons, but I think we do have to get rid of the prison industrial complex. Yes, I think I that's agree. a huge problem. And that was the first point you made? Uh, I think but I'm generally yeah, in agreement. We need, a, yeah. we need the criminal justice reform because it's just a piece of institutional racism. Yes, uh, we should abolish the death penalty because of the racism, decriminalizing the marijuana and then attack the other parts like in healthcare, education, the economy. Right. So it's very much part of it. I'm sorry. I would also get rid of cash bail. Yes. Because that disproportionately yeah. harms communities of color. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, the, you mentioned lobbyists a little bit earlier. Um, can you comment on the, the amount of power the Israel lobby in particular wield within our legislature? Have any criticism of the pro-Israel lobby, the state of Israel, or our support of it um, get silenced under the label of anti-Semitism? Super PAC is because I think the way Washington works is that those who have a great deal of money and those who have lobbyists tend to get their way. And bills are written in the dead of night. And so uh, that's why I want to actually remove the power from the ultra wealthy into the hands of voters, regular yeah. people who just care about their democracy. Um, I don't agree with how you frame the issue because I am 100% pro Israel. Um, but I understand why you're concerned about money in politics, um, because I think money in politics is the problem, Senator, which is why I am for public funded elections. You're, you're, you are pro-Israel then? Which, which is like, since like Jimmy Carter, we've known it's sort of been an apartheid state, a very, a very racist state. I understand your concerns very much, um, but I support Israel because it's the only democracy in the Middle East, and I want them to survive. And so they will need the support of America to not be bombed into oblivion. So that's why I support Israel. I agree, though, that you're concerned about um, anti-Muslim fervor and, and that racism as well. I'm against that racism as well. But I think both sides need protection. Are you okay, aware that this is? We've really got to go. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. I hope you don't mind yes, my answer. Ahead. Now, you've changed a lot in the last 10 years. That's that's fine. It's normal. It's actually, it's practice. It's good. You're not, you live and learn. Exactly. You're not the same person now, nor you're going to be the same person you are today, 10 years from now. But what's the one thing that stayed true to you that's never changed? Yeah, what's, that, that I, I love my neighbor, that I will fight for someone else's kid as hard as I fight for my own, and that our job on this planet is to help others. That is who I am. Thank you very much. Sorry, we've got to go to the gas
has it been and do you feel like you're breaking through? It is both? so exciting. Um, what I love about coming to New Hampshire is that the people in New Hampshire take their responsibility of being the first in the nation primary very seriously. And they definitely want to meet you five or six times, which is wonderful. And so I feel welcome. I feel that folks here want to know who I am, what I stand for, why I'm running, and why I'm going to beat Donald Trump. And I really want to tell them, so it's exciting for me. Um, I also found a lot of commonality in New Hampshire and challenges in New York. Today I did two roundtables on the pollution in water it, from PFAS and PFOA, two chemicals that I believe are carcinogens that are truly harming our communities and our lives and our children. And so having that commonality of being able to lift up their voices and fight for the kinds of changes we need in Washington, taking on the corruption of this current EPA administrator and this current president who has no empathy and no care for human health and the real struggles people face um, is what I think this campaign's about. It's about lifting up voices and making sure they're heard. Uh, Mayor de Blasio is coming to New Hampshire tomorrow and he'll be here Sunday too doing some campaign stops. What do you make of his flirtation with the presidential race and what do you think about the idea of him actually running? I know why I'm running. I'm running because I really want to restore what's been lost in this country. I think President Trump really has divided us in a way that's very destructive. But I'm grateful that we have so many Democrats. It just shows that we are going to fight for this country. And I personally um, believe that this is a moment where each of us have to respond to that call to just make a difference and to elevate voices that aren't being heard and take on the corruption and greed in Washington that defines everything and restore this democracy to the hands of regular people. Has he done a good job as mayor? Uh, he's done a couple of things that I really appreciate. Being for a universal pre-K was perhaps the most important thing he did as mayor. All right, we got, uh, this is Tina, she's from Vermont. Hi. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you for being here and answering my question. Um, I'm leaving in one week from tomorrow to go to Homestead, Florida to document the 1,700 children that are being held in a facility, um, a, a juvenile detention facility. Yeah. It's on federal property so that there's no state child welfare oversight. Oh, no. Senator Merkley went there this week and oh, said no. it was absolutely chilly. Oh. And that it was just, it tore him to pieces to yeah. see that. So this is a for-profit detention center and they are staffing up right now to hold 2,400 children under Trump's administration's orders. The job description for the guards, I saw that in the paper the other day, and I cannot sleep since then. It says, the job description says, you must be able to apply approved restraint techniques and otherwise manage or coerce the full weight of an infant or an adolescent. Oh. I mean, if they should not be, you know, and I know you talk a lot about children and you're going to fight for other people's children as hard as you fought for your own children. So what I'd like for you to do is to go down to Homestead and witness what's going on there because it's on federal I property. Will. I will go down. And that you demand yeah. that we shut down these children's prison camps I because will. they're immoral. There's a Senate bill. Would you be willing to co-sponsor that? Which one is it? It's 397. It's from Senator Merkley introduced it just recently. Oh, I'll definitely look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would absolutely. You, will you demand the end of these child detention I will. facilities? I absolutely will. And child prison camps in this country. I, will. I, I went to visit them in Texas. So you did. I went to two in McAllen, and I was horrified. The one I saw was a abandoned Walmart that was now housing boys from age 10 to 17. It looks like a prison. They had to wear exactly the same clothes. All their beds were made just like in a prison camp. When I got to talk to the boys, which I was not allowed to do, and they said outside time. I said, well, how much time do you get to go outside? Two hours a day. That sounds like a prison. They had to walk in a straight line. They weren't allowed to hug each other or even touch each other. Imagine if two little boys. Those are the ages of my boys. It was horrific. And the trauma that they are causing for these children is incomprehensible. The second facility I went to was was, was run by GEO, a for-profit prison system, and it was a facility for mothers and children. And no fathers allowed, because even if they came as a family to the border, they'd separate them immediately, which is inhumane. It's what we did in the slave trade, literally. Like, this is so outrageous how we are treating human beings who are seeking our assistance, asylum seekers. So in that facility, here's the worst thing. So I'm, I'm touring the facility, and I go into, there's a chapel, and I see two women on their knees, tears streaming down their eyes. These are not people 
who feel safe and secure. Second thing, I saw some ladies sweeping, and I was like, what's going on here? And, and, I, and, and I saw the phones, and they said, yeah, the phones are so they can call home. I was like, well, what happens if they don't have money? They said they can do custodial work for $2 a day. That sounds just like a prison. I, I don't know how that's legal. I really, literally don't know how that's legal. So I do want to abolish these for-profit prison facilities. Um, the reason why I called to get rid of ICE and reimagine ICE and repurpose it is because this part. The enforcement removal operations part is inhumane. It should be not under Homeland Security. It is not a national security issue. It is an immigration issue that should go under Department of Justice. We should have real immigration judges that are appointed for life, that are not just beholden to the Department of Justice and answers to the Attorney General. Um, they should have a proper asylum system. When they come to this country, they should be allowed to um, go into the community and come back for their hearings. Um, and then the part of, 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 of ICE that I do support is the part that's anti-terrorism. Why not allow them to actually get a real budget, um, to have a new name? Because 19 ICE agents said our reputation is so destroyed because of all the family separations at the border, local law enforcement won't work with us. So why not? Why not? give them a, a, a new mission, a new mantle, and a new name, and actually do the anti-terrorism work, anti-drug trafficking, anti-human trafficking, anti-gun trafficking, and fund that. But take, stop funding these for-profit prisons. Willing to go to Homestead for just yes. one day and yes, see the absolutely. children and, and, and give us some oversight, some yeah, transparency? Yeah, I'll find out the next time Jeff's going. Okay, and, and it's 397, Bill 397. I'll we'll okay. let you know. Evan yeah. will follow up. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Quick New Zealand question. You might yes. have addressed it earlier today, but uh, given the attack on the mosque there, uh, how concerned are you about the rise of white nationalism in the U.S.? and globally as well. I, I'm very concerned about it because President Trump finds moral equivalencies. He literally, um, in this Charlottesville issue, he just kept saying, oh, there's good people on both sides. Well, no, there actually isn't because there are people who are white supremacists, who are racist, who are anti-Semitic, and the rise of hatred in our country has only grown, and the rise of hate crimes has only grown. It's just unbelievable that this president just continues to put fuel on the fire of hatred and bigotry. It's not who we are in our best moments as a nation, and it's not who we should be in the future. So I, I, I think it's outrageous. And so I, my heart goes out to the victims. It is, it is a horrible shooting and another crisis in the, in the world. Um, but we need a president who's actually going to do the right things and stand up to the NRA and stand up against hate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming Thank out. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. Thank I will look at that bill and get you an answer right away. That's great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Who's it called? Oh, yeah. Your old district. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I just did a PFOA roundtable today. That's, yeah. It's, it's crushing. Yeah, I missed that. Unfortunately, I was supposed to be there. I missed it. That's why I got to come over here. And I'm glad you came. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, I think we're going to come tomorrow morning. So we'll cover the Yeah. Oh, no, it's very exciting.